Hey, book by book. It's a thrill for me, Richard Buse is my name, to be joining you for this exciting series of studies in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Actually, we've got to study number six, and we're joined here today by Paul Blackham, who's always with us, actually, and then by uh, George Vower, who's really from the United States, but actually resident in England, but actually, no, travels the whole world in his mission for God. And uh, it's uh, good to share with you, George, today. Thank you very much indeed for joining us once more. We're doing the Acts of the Apostles, and I get to read this time from Acts chapter 13, uh, and starting at verse 1 and reading on. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and it gives their names. And it goes on verse 2. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So the Holy Spirit is in charge. And Antioch, in a strange way, has become the centre. Jerusalem seems to be out of the picture, George. And Antioch is really a non-Jewish city. What's the significance of what of what's this is all about? God doesn't always work the way that we think he should work. And they were scattered from Jerusalem, which was a key place. And the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And then they later had that Jerusalem meeting. But God chose to make this unusual city with people of, of non-Jewish origin as the key mission launching place. And we find Paul and Barnabas, and it's beautiful how they're sent out by the Holy Spirit, but also sent out by the church. This is a young church, and yet here they are already sending two workers out, which just should so speak to our hearts because today there are many churches that have not sent out a missionary 10, 20, or 30 years and yet they would say that they believe the Bible. This is a very key passage for the church in the 21st century. And it's also emphasizing, I suppose, that mission is crisscrossing the world already. So it's not dependent on Jerusalem. I mean, is it right to say that, that Christianity is itself not dependent on a single shrine anywhere? Is that right? Mm. Well, that's right. There's no shrine and it's not a geography-based thing. And it's not like it's one culture or anything like that. It's like all the time, the center of the work of Christ around the world is wherever Jesus is. And, you know, we might say, oh, what Canterbury at one time or maybe, or, but Nairobi, what's going on in Nairobi? <laughs> what's going on in India? What's going on in China? What's going on in South America? It's all over the world happening in all different languages and cultures. It's all over. Oh, actually, and I think of dress code. I mean, there's no one dress code that That's marks it. out a Christian. You can be in, in uh, Iceland. Or you could be in Honolulu, yeah. but uh, but Christians can wear whatever they should be wearing. Yeah. There's no one particular dress code. Or any, you don't have to wear a special hat. No. Like <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? It's fantastic. Antioch says quite a lot to us, I think, in, in these uh, verses Well, here. you can even wear a global jacket. It's allowed. Yeah, well, it's allowed. Well, you're yeah. famous for your yeah, global without, jackets. Look even at that. without a necktie. I mean, it's <laughs> liberty and it's, I it's can finally see. come to the body of Christ. <laughs> I can see London right there on your, on yeah. your, on your chest there. Over my heart. Yes. <laughs> well, then verse 27, as we read on here, the famine relief now comes on to Judea. Now, why is that important, George? Is it, why does Luke pick that out as being important? Because God is concerned about people's physical condition. We see that right through the whole of the Bible. I think of David Shepherd, the great bishop of Liverpool. I remember when he visited our ship here, and I remember his book, about bias toward the poor. I remember that book. It's one of the books that God used together with many other books and people to completely change my life because I thought at one time it was all mainly proclamation, discipleship, church planting. But through careful study of the scriptures and godly people influencing me, uh, I saw that these have to come together. You may remember the great Lausanne Congress. I was there. And John Stott helped write that document that put proclamation social action, yeah. social concern, together in world mission. As part of the great world mission. And we mission. got plenty of seeds of that right back here in the, mm. in the, in the New Testament, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's right. It's so, it's so important. And then as we come on, actually, from that bit, we're really on, it's a quite a large chunk. Well, we can't do it all, friends. I mean, so that the study guide is going to help us quite a lot in this, these particular chapters. So it's worth getting hold of that. But we, we can do... Some of it, anyway, right now. As we look at chapter 12, now there's Peter's remarkable escape from Herod's prison. Paul 
Tell us about it. What is? It's a bit strange, isn't it? Well, there's two. I think there's two strange things. There's one like an, this angel who comes and gets him out. And, and, pe- and sometimes people think of angels as like little cuddly babies or something. But look at this angel. He's, he's, he's really, it reminds us that angels are really more like warriors or soldiers. So if you look in chapter 12 and verse 7, this angel from the Lord busts in. And then he, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up and just goes, quick, get up. <laughs> and then you're like, you, what a rude way to be woken up. And then he sort of gets him on his feet and marches him out. Put on your clothes and sandals you know and he's giving all these very tough orders and the doors open one by one the doors open and then once they got out the length of one street as it says in verse 10 suddenly the angel left him so this angel's you know he's not really got a lot of social graces this angel but he's at least he bails him out and then the church had been praying for peter to be released so then peter gets to the church to the place where they're all praying knocks on the door and they're not even expecting the prayer to be answered so this servant rhoda Luke names her. He names her. He knows who she is. And she goes and says, oh, Peter's here. That's brilliant. And they go, which is a very strange response. They go, no, it's just his ghost. And you think, (laughs) even, wouldn't that be weird if Peter's ghost came to the door? But they're like, no, no, just ignore it. It's just his ghost. He's he's like his angel. (laughs) It's just Peter's angel. Ignore it. It'll go away. And then eventually he manages to get in. But it's such a strange little story. But it's wonderful, really. And it it emphasizes what George was saying about how the, the, the supernatural spiritual realities that we often don't take account of. And there's this angel and it's all about that. And I love this little story. It's very human also because when you think of how dumbfounded the church is when its prayers get answered yeah. you, just, you a, can't believe it it's a powerful testimony to the importance of the prayer meeting yeah and without the book of acts we actually wouldn't know much about the need to gather in prayer but we see that in acts 12 mm. we see it again in acts 13 that personal prayer of course is a priority but gathering in prayer is a biblical practice that we should all be involved in yes. that goes right back to the book of Acts. Yeah, And indeed. it was in a house. He came to the house where many were gathered praying. It's clear. And we need to somehow take this on board. Let's move on quickly, friends. As we come to chapter 13, we've got a lot to do here. Verses 1 to 3. The leadership, the guidance of the Holy Spirit there in Antioch does seem extraordinary. How is this power displayed when Paul and Barnabas arrive in Cyprus on the first missionary journey? Would you like to think well, with us about that? Of course, that? they had to use a ship. You, you see, they were into <laughs> ships back then as mm. well. But and they also ran into difficulty because Mark didn't work out and they eventually he left them. But as they arrived there, they preached the word of God in the synagogue. And that's again, bringing into balance what we just talked about. We need that social action, but we must not neglect also the preaching of the Word of God and, of course, his opposition as well. Mm. Yes, and then there's uh, Paul's great uh, sermon in uh, Pisidian Antioch, verse 16 following. Do you see there, Paul? Yeah. Verse 29, what's the main point of his sermon, actually? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, he's preaching on this same issue about saying what is the truth about knowing the living God for the whole world according to the ancient scriptures. Because remember, it'd be no good if he just came along to all the people of God who were relying on the ancient scriptures and just said, forget all that stuff. We've got something brand new going on. It's a global thing. Forget about the Hebrew scriptures. No, he never does that. He's saying, let's go back to the Hebrew scriptures and find out what is the truth from those scriptures. So he preaches this sermon and explains that Well, if you look down at verse 39, through Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. So the point of the sermon is simply to say the law of Moses wasn't there to save you. The law of Moses was there to prepare you, point you forward to Jesus the promised Messiah. It's the same theme that we come up against, uh, up against in Acts time and time again. The ancient scriptures were prophesying, predicting, looking forward to Jesus, the promised Messiah, and the global spread of his kingdom. Yes. And then, I mean, we're, we're covering a lot of ground, you know, in these verses. Just as we almost close off, how do Paul and Barnabas handle the reaction of the unbelieving Jews there in verse, just further on, verse 14 to 52? George, 
They do something, don't they, Paul and Barnabas? Well, first of all, we need to notice that the Gentiles were getting saved and were praising God. Yeah. Yeah. But some of the Jewish people were very upset and they were rejecting the message. And in this case, Paul said, look, we're going to go somewhere else. He sort of indicates we're going to go more. We're going to go now more to the Gentiles if you're not going to accept it. And he... uh, he, what's that word he used? The sand under his... Shake yeah, the dust shakes off. The dust yeah, off yeah. shakes the dust off. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's a place for that, evidently. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes people will stay in an area for months and years. Before the missionary journey comes to an end, Paul, things become a bit strange. In Lystra? Yeah. Uh, how did Paul handle this sort of interfaith dialogue? And with this one, we really end. Well, that's right. He's that's coming, 14. It's chapter in 14. chapter 14. And they eight. come to... And, and it's interesting because they've been... Cu- they're each time, they're coming up against cultural barriers and overcoming them over and over again. And this time, they're in this example where they're just coming right into the middle of a pagan religion. And uh, he, when this man is healed, they... It, from their religious perspective, all these people say the gods have come down to us in human form and they think Barnabas is Zeus and Paul is Hermes. In a way, they're sort of like trying to compliment Paul and Barnabas and they're kind of incorporating right. them into their religious system. Now, Paul and Barnabas, though, they don't go, oh, that's great. Yeah, thanks for the compliment. That's brilliant. They actually like, no, no, you're thinking about the world completely wrong. The gods are not like that. If the gods were just like human beings, like superpowered human beings that's not the explanation for reality that doesn't explain the creation of the heavens and the earth that's far too small a worldview we want to tell you about Jesus the real living God who made the heavens and the earth and doesn't require anything from us and all that sort of thing now of course in saying that they provoke quite a reaction <laughs> the, the people in the end they beat up Paul uh, stone yeah. him and he's dragged out and he's left for, left dead. for dead but it's sort of showing us just that is what happens. If you're going to witness to Jesus, sometimes you're going to be drawn into these quite really difficult and dangerous situations, particularly as we come up against other worldviews and faith systems. It's a very rocky ride as we close off. Just to recognise the fact that they're moving from event to event to event, but behind it all, the steady undergirding of prayer. I ask you, I ask ourselves, How is the prayer meeting going? Is there a prayer meeting at the church? How is it going? Who comes? How many? Do the workers turn up? Is the pastor there? Let's work at prayer as they did in the Acts of the Apostles. God bless you and God bless us all.